Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well. Today we're going to look at scene 5 of Act 5. So we're quickly coming to the end of Macbeth as well as to the school year. So if you take a look on your screen, what I'm asking us to do is be able to look at how Shakespeare structures scene 5 uh, to help us see how Macbeth's ambition has contributed to his downfall. So um, I'm going to take you guys a step back and take a look at the ending of scene four because here Shakespeare again structures the scene in a particular way to help the audience um, become aware of what's to come. So remember that one of the prophecies, one of the apparitions that the witches gave Macbeth is that no man born of woman will ever be able to defeat Macbeth. And this has caused him to, uh, to feel overconfident in himself. And the last apparition was the um, Burnham Wood marching towards Dunsinane, and that's where Macbeth's castle is. And Macbeth knows that it, there's no way possible for a forest to move and gain, um, you know, gain siege of his, of his castle. So again, he's very confident in, um, you know, in his position as, as king. Here in scene four, which I have the last part again um, on the screen for you, the, uh, the soldiers are getting ready to, to fight Macbeth. And so I'm asking you what clues are given in these two speeches that Macbeth will soon be defeated. It's the complete opposite of what the apparitions um, had, had shown Macbeth. So Macduff is coming. Remember that he wants revenge for um, for the killing of his family, and the soldiers are all excited. They're they're marching towards Macbeth's castle, and they're mentioning, they're commenting that a lot of people had um, left Macbeth and are now fighting in uh, Malcolm and Macduff's corner. And Macduff says, "Don't worry about that. Um, you know, we're not going to judge them for 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 leaving the king." Um, he says, "Attend the true event." and put we on industrious soldiership. So he says, forget about making a judgment, forget about talking about how these soldiers left their king, put on your armor, act like a real soldier, and let's do what we came here to do. And so Seward, who's marching alongside Macduff, says, uh, the time approaches that will with due decision make us know what we shall say we have and what we owe. So he's telling the soldiers, soon we're going to find out if this kingdom is going to be ours or if it's not. And obviously he's talking about Scotland. And so he continues and um, he says, we need to move towards, uh, towards uh, you know, Macbeth's castle and, and begin this, this war. So again, I'm asking you for what clues are given in the speech that Macbeth will soon be defeated. One is that you have a lot of these soldiers who have left Macbeth and are now going to fight on Malcolm and Macduff's side. You also then have to look at Seward's speech here, and it says, the time approaches. So Macbeth again is feeling very confident, but remember, after the third apparition, there was one more vision, and that was a whole line of kings right, that were marching. And so the last prophecy is that Banquo's children are going to be kings, right? He's not going to be king, but his descendants will be. So here, the word time is meant to foreshadow that Macbeth, again, knows he, he can't be king forever. That was part of the, the prophecy. And time continues to pass on. Okay. He also goes on and he talks about, he meaning, meaning C word, that they march towards Dunsany, towards which advance the war. Okay. So there is something approaching Macbeth's castle. And again, this is part of the, the, the apparition. So we know how they're marching, and I want to draw your attention to that in, uh, in scene four. So I'm going to move the screen up a little bit. I'm sorry, down. 
I have it here for you already. Malcolm, Seward, Macduff, all of the soldiers are getting ready. And if you take a look here, Malcolm tells every soldier to bear with them something. So let's take a look at the modern translation. Malcolm orders, tell every soldier to break off a branch and hold it in front of him. That way, we can conceal how many of us there are, and Macbeth's spies will give him inaccurate reports. So this is how that prophecy is going to um, become true, right? Seward says, what's the name of the forest that's behind him? Burnham Wood is. So Malcolm says, I want every soldier to grab a branch from that forest that's behind us. In essence, we're going to put it in front of us, and we're going to march towards Dunsinane. And this is then at the end here, um, what he's talking about. I'm sorry, I need to bring you up here. What he's talking about, let's advance. So this foreshadows, again, that the prophecy is going to become true, and therefore Macbeth is going to be defeated. So let's take a look at scene five together. If you have your script downloaded, scene five is at the bottom of page 66. Okay. So you have Macbeth, Seton, and the soldiers with drum and colors. So the colors are in reference to, to the flag um, that they're going to be holding up. Seton is one of the servants of Macbeth and You've seen him mentioned and, and come in a, a few times. Remember that Lady Macbeth is, is very sick, and the doctor found absolutely no cure for her except to confess her sins. So here, again, let's take a look at how Shakespeare structures this particular scene to help us see how Macbeth's ambition contributed to his downfall. Hang out our banners on the outward walls. The cry is still, they come. Our castle's strength will laugh a siege to scorn. Here, let them lie till famine and the egg you eat them up. Were they not forced with those that should be ours, we might have met them dare for beard to beard and beat them backward home. What is that noise? It is the cry of women, my good lord. I have almost forgot the taste of fears. The time has been my senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek, and my fell of hair would at a dismal treaties rouse and stir as life were in it. I have supped full with horrors. Direness, familiar to my slaughterous thoughts, cannot once start me. So I'm going to stop here because, again, we're focusing on the structure, right? And this is a perfect example of how quickly things begin to shift um, as Shakespeare writes this scene. So Macbeth knows that the army, Macduff's army, is quickly approaching. So he tells the soldiers that are left to hang out their banners on the outer walls. And um, as he's doing this, if you take a look at the modern translation... Everyone, all the soldiers are screaming, here they come, our castle is strong enough to laugh off their siege, is Macbeth's uh, response. So Macbeth here is feeling very confident in himself, right? They're saying there's a huge army that's on their way, and yet Macbeth says, our castle is strong enough to laugh off their siege. He continues and he says, they can sit out there until they die of hunger and disease, if it weren't for the fact that so many of our soldiers revolted and joined them, we could have met them out in front of the castle, man to man, and beaten them back to England. So here, Macbeth is really not concerned with the, the fact that he doesn't have as many soldiers as he did in the beginning. Just to make this a little smaller for us. So Macbeth continues to feel confident. I need to make this a little smaller for us. Okay. Macbeth continues to feel confident in himself. Okay. 
So he recognizes that a lot of people have fled, have gone to, to join the other, the other team. However, he says they could just sit out there and they could die because they'll never be able to, to defeat me. However, now notice the shift. As he's saying this, we hear the cry of a woman. Okay, so the stage directions here are very important. And Macbeth asks, what is that noise? And Seton says, it is the cry of women, my good lord. And he leaps. So structuring, you have Macbeth very confident. He hears a cry, a loud scream of agony. And then notice what he begins to, to do or what he begins to say. He says, I'm, I've almost forgotten what fear feels like. There was a time when I would have been terrified by a shriek in the night, and the hair on my skin would have stood up when I heard a ghost story. But now, I've had my fill of real horrors. Horrible things are so familiar that they can't startle me. So he's very ambitious, right? He's, he's um, very confident in himself. He hears the cry, and he, you know, gets a little scared. And then he says, whoa, I almost forgot what fear feels like. And then he quickly goes back to saying, it doesn't matter. I've had my fair share of things that frighten me. Nothing is going to startle me. Okay. So I'm going to highlight this here for us. And just note that for a minute, Macbeth um, feels scared. But quickly, uh, reverts back to his overconfidence. And I'll fix that for us. Just one more. And that's good. Okay. So how does he do that? Again, he goes and he says, horrible things are so familiar that they can't startle me. Structure. Confident, becomes scared for a minute, and then goes back to feeling confident in himself. Let's figure out exactly why that scream, that loud, um, agonizing yell was for. Wherefore was that cry? The queen, my lord, is dead. So, similar to the other uh, murder scenes um, where obviously someone dies, here Shakespeare decides to leave out uh, Lady Macbeth's death from the, the audience. We just hear about it afterwards. So we heard the cry, and now we see that the queen, Lady Macbeth, is dead. We have to find out exactly how she died. Take a look now at how Macbeth reacts to his wife's death. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow. And tomorrow. And tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out. Out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Thou comes to use thy tongue, thy story quickly. Great. 
So before we continue and learn what the messenger has to say, let's talk a little bit about Macbeth's reaction to his wife. So the servant Seton comes and he says, the queen is dead. And Macbeth says, well, she would have died later anyway. I was expecting the news at some point. So he, he doesn't seem as devastated as he should about his wife's death. It almost seems as though Macbeth, is, his mind is just so caught up in, in, in himself and wanting to, to retain the throne that nothing else uh, is important or there isn't enough room in his life for other things to be important. It's a very important um, soliloquy from Macbeth, the famous tomorrow, tomorrow, and tomorrow um, from Shakespeare. And he goes and he's pretty much just, just telling us that it seems that um, we're fools, uh, that we just think that life is supposed to be great and, and it really isn't. He goes and he talks about, um, or he says, out, out, brief candle. We know Lady Macbeth uh, was holding that candle while she was sleepwalking. Um, I want you to think about what this can symbolize. Um, and then he goes and he says, you know, life being great or being something that's uh, that that that's anything other than an illusion is just a story that is told by an idiot. Uh, it, it really is, and life is just just an illusion. So here he's playing Macbeth is playing on the theme, right, uh, of, of appearance versus reality, of, of illusions. So if Macbeth realizes that a life is an illusion, then should he have believed in those apparitions and the prophecies of the witches? So he's going to find out something from the messenger. Let's take a look at what it is. My lord, I should report that which I say I saw, but know not how to do it. Well, say, sir. As I did stand my watch upon the hill, I looked toward Burnham, and anon me thought the wood began to move. Life! So Macbeth just finished saying that life is an illusion. He shouldn't be concerned with, uh, you know, with what people say, because they're all they're all idiots who don't understand that that life is isn't real. Is you know the the idea of a happy life isn't real. And then the messenger comes in and he says, I, I don't even know how to explain this to you, but as I'm at the top here looking at the army approaching, I, I see what appears to be the forest moving towards us. And now we see a shift in Macbeth's confidence. Yeah. And slave, let me endure your wrath if it be not so. Within this three mile may you see it coming, I say, a moving grove. Uh, if thou speakest false, upon the next tree shall thou hang alive till famine cling thee. Uh, if thy speech be sooth, I care not if thou dost for me as much. Yeah. I pull in resolution and begin to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. Fear not till Burnham Wood do come to Dunsinane. And now a wood comes toward Dunsinane. Arm! Arm and out! If this which he avouches does appear, there is no flying hence nor tarrying here. I begin to be weary of the sun and wish the estate of the world were now undone. Ring the alarm bell! Blow wind, come rack, at least we'll die with harness on our back. So that brings us to the end of the scene. And now Shakespeare, you can hear it in his voice, he's um, a little bit afraid. And he, he first thinks, you know, the messenger is lying, it can't be true. And then he says, I, I don't feel that confident, I don't know if I should believe him. And he says, I, I, I remember what the devil, and remember we talked about Hecate and uh, the witches um, earlier on in, uh, in Act 3. He goes and he says, I, I feel like what they told me was lies, although it sounded like the truth. And he repeats the third apparition. Don't worry until Burnham Wood comes to Dunsinane. And so he says, well, now they're coming. So I have to prepare for battle. And what we see here is Macbeth kind of 
uh, going back, returning to his original state where he was this brave soldier and wasn't afraid of, of fighting. He doesn't have confidence in himself at this point here, but he says, if it's coming, then my only option is to gear up, put my armor on, and go fight. Now keep in mind that there is still that other apparition um, that told Macbeth that no man born of a woman will ever be able to defeat Macbeth. So now we're going to see how that part plays into the next scene. So here, hopefully, you were able to follow along with me and see how Shakespeare structures the scene. Macbeth is confident, and then he slowly begins to lose that confidence as part of the apparitions, part of the prophecies, become true. And we also see how Lady Macbeth is it never comes back on you know back on stage or back into the story again she dies and we still need to figure out exactly why and how this really helps to develop her character so your job is going to be to read the next scenes and then we will continue our discussion on friday